And listen, man, this is like the locker room. I needed this, man. I, I, me and Fred been talking for a long time about me coming on, and we just, it just didn't time up. But I needed this locker room energy, man. I haven't had this shit since I retired. You know what I mean? Like, Hollywood is just not the same. It's not, you know? People don't even... What's weird is that I set out to change uh, my identity and reinvent myself, and I almost did it too well. You know what I'm saying? Because I kind of got lost from this energy, which is what I've done the majority of my life. So most people now know me in Hollywood as an actor, you know what I'm saying, which as Thomas Q. Jones. But um, just this energy, man, is like, the, you know, it's the just- The crazy I'm, thing, we were just talking too, talking about being careful with word. You, you said retirement. Right. I say career change. Right. But we've been talking for a minute to try to make this happen, right? <laughs> and uh, you say people know you as an actor. I think everybody in the world, if they Googled you, your Wikipedia said American actor. Right. Football is almost non-existent. But for the people who don't actually know you, you was a hell of a player, played 12 years. But more importantly, you have just recently nominated uh, for Pro Football Hall of Fame, big shout out. You retired in the top 25, 10,000 yard club. And that's, that's a feat that everybody since the history of the game been trying to do is a mass more than 10,000 yards. It's only 26, I think 26 in the world that have ever done that. And the NFL has been around over 100 years. But people might not, you know, that, that might not be the one thing that pops out to people when they think of you because you got spicy sex scenes and all this other shit on TV. <laughs> you know, you got all these different levels to you now. So right, I'm just right. glad you're here, bro. Appreciate man, you. I'm glad Appreciate to be you. here, man. And I'm just proud of y'all for creating this platform for us to have a voice, man. You know, yes, we played in the era where there wasn't the internet, you know what I'm saying, like that. It wasn't social media, so we didn't have a voice, we didn't have an outlet. So the people that were speaking for us were speaking based off of the, their bias, whether they liked us or not, you know what I'm saying? So people didn't really get um, the real, honest conversations from us. So what you all are doing with this, this podcast, man, is groundbreaking, you know what I mean? Because you're not just interviewing football players, you're interviewing people. And, and this is making NFL players who are hosting this platform look more like people than just one-dimensional NFL players. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? So I've been proud of y'all from the jump. I follow every episode. Um, you know, I'm always laughing at this dude right here. Uh, well, we're you mostly know. scared. Don't yeah. worry, I got, I got something yeah. for you. Yeah, oh, I know you do. <laughs> I, I know you got something for me. Hey. I know you got But even this guy on the field, you know, um, talking shit the whole game, never shut his mouth. I'm never shut up. I'm like, well, this dude shut up. I just got a nine yard run and he's still talking. But damn, still talking. You, you knocked my shoulder out of place twice. I gotta do something. <laughs> <laughs> Your big ass coming hey. down here. Hold up. Limitless. Take a sim and cap pin in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Get my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a sim and cap pin in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Get my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. First off, though, man, like, like Freddie T said, though, we're super excited uh, to have you for, for the people who don't know you as Thomas Jones, the football player, we want them to learn about him, but we also want to learn about Thomas Jones with six siblings that all graduated from college, right? Parents who were, were, were in the coal mining and the different things you had to go through. You actually wrote a book about it. So we want to get into all those things, but welcome to The Pivot. Uh, this is Freddie T, Freaky Freddie, Freddie Flowers, whatever you want to talk, call him. This is Chan. We already know Chan gonna Chan, I'm RC. We're sitting here with Thomas Quinn Jones. Shout out to Happy Dad, shout out to DraftKings. We thank you guys for all the support. Remember, subscribe, like, whether it's YouTube, Apple, Spotify, we, could, we appreciate all the support. And for me, but really from Freddie T, we always said, right, this is a show and anybody can podcast, but not everybody can pivot. So back to you, T, you know, you think about where you are now. And even before we started the show, you were speaking about the locker room and how you kind of lost that in trying to, I guess, get rid of the, the old Thomas to move into a new phase of life, into a second career, as Freddie T often says. But there had to be some foundation that set that into place. And listening to you throughout your career, even, you know, your new career in acting, you always mention your dad and the way he taught you to work, whether it was as an athlete or just also the, the person. 
having six siblings, your brother Julius, who I played against um, as well, you know, your three sisters, I think they all graduated from University of Virginia as well. What was that upbringing like, especially being from a small town, you know, coal mining town, and just the, not only the success that you and your brother had, which was so public because of the sport you guys played, but for all of you to be high achievers, you know, uh, I think your mother's name was, was Betty, your father, Thomas, just the things they had to instill in you guys about hard work, being from where you're from, to propel you to where you are. Yeah, I, I came from um, uh, very humbling beginnings. You know, a really small town in Virginia called Big Stone Gap. Uh, it's a coal mining town. It's in the uh, far southwest uh, part of Virginia. Uh, usually when you, when you think of Virginia, you think of uh, 757, Hampton, Newport News, uh, Allen Iverson, Michael Vick, yeah. all those guys. Um, but I'm, I'm nine hours away from them. I'm, I'm on the total opposite end of the state, nine hours away. Um, so uh, most of the time when people come to Virginia, uh, they don't come to my area. T, you, you finish eighth in Heisman voting. Uh, I finished something like no votes. You know what I mean? And, and, and I just remember like being in college and even afterwards in high school, what it, what it felt like to just watch young men sit there or, or see the votes and have your name there. It seems like that would just be such a great accomplishment, almost a fulfillment of goals. You played 12 years in the NFL, you're drafted in the top 10. Now you've moved into entertainment and become a, a, a successful actor. Those, those aren't goals of someone who has small dreams. What made you feel like all of these things you've accomplished were possible? Oh, uh, man. <laughs> I think that's the benefit of growing up in a small town. All you have is, is your dreams. Um, mm. You know, you have TV, you have radio. Uh, but other than that, you really don't have access to too much, you know, outside of uh, what's right in front of you. Um, my town was about 4,000 people. My graduating class was 120. So in my mind, um, I always imagined myself being out in the world and, 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 and being in, on play, in places that I would see on TV. I'd watch Yo! MTV Raps, um, and I would see all the new clothes and the new shoes, and, and um, I would just imagine myself having that stuff. Um, used to watch that show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, way yeah. back in the day. You see all the houses and all the celebrities. When I would see those things on TV, I, I would always imagine me being where those people are and wearing what they're wearing. Um, and I think that was my motivation to get there, despite not too many people from my area being able to accomplish that. Coming from a city like that, because I was in Tampa and Atlanta, bigger cities. Coming from a little city like that, 4,000 people, when you shoot at a girl, do you got to ask your mom, is that your cousin? <laughs> <laughs> like, can you freely talk no, to somebody no, at the no, gas that's station? A good, that's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, it's a small, it's a small area. Um, and usually in small areas like that, a lot of people know each other. They related to each other. Um, you know, I had a girlfriend when I was in high school, but she went to another school that was about 30, 40 minutes away. So I, I didn't have any research. Well, I just, yeah, I knew she wasn't my cousin. <laughs> so that's, so that's a start. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, in areas like that, it's, it's small. You know, it's very family oriented. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, you know it's, it's a football town. You know, places like that are just, you know, you have football. You know, literally, my, uh, my dad would always say, if you wanted to rob a bank, uh, you should do it on a Friday night where everybody's at the football yep. game. Everybody's there, the police, the fire department, everybody's there. So. Um, you know, although it was a small area, you know, it was a very good place for me to grow up because, you know, I, it gave me an opportunity to, to establish some really good morals um, and, and work ethic and dedication, especially following suit from my mom and my dad. When we look at, at you now, you seem to have like this truly diverse sense of interest. Right, it's, it's not just like the, the one-sided thing. Like I just remember playing football, bro, and I was like, I'm just gonna be the best football player I could possibly be, and then I'll work on the rest of life later. And then I got into year 10, and I was like, hell, they finna kick me out of here in a second. I need to start <laughs> working on something else. Right. Uh, for you, and even having all these diverse interests, which we've seen now that you're out of football, what was your love for football like, though? Like, you don't get to be as good as you are, 
right? You don't get to look like Channing the way you do in that shirt, because I can tell you both are on the same workout program. Relax, boss. Yeah, I can tell that both of y'all on, <laughs> on the same. <laughs> Man, <laughs> <can> sit back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can tell that both of y'all on the same workout program. But when you when you were locked into football, when it was your career, you know, what was that dedication like for you? Because I remember, man, in the stadium, in the middle of the field, you know what I'm saying, it's 21 personnel, you know, two wide receivers, a tight end, and you you in the, in the eye, and I'm like, man, they're going to give him this ball on this ISO. I hope Potsy and Foot going to get him down first, because if this big joker get running, <laughs> now I got to hit him, and they expecting me to bring him down in the open field. So you could tell you were dedicated to it. But was that truly always your priority, and that was, was what you were focused on? I think it was having a chip on my shoulder, always proving people wrong. Um, when I came out in high school, uh, after my junior season, I, I rushed for over 3,000 yards and 45 touchdowns, and we won the state championship. That was one season? My junior season, yeah. Um, and so all the high school football publications would come out, um, and they had me ranked in the top 10, but they would always say, he's not playing against high comp competition. And then when I went to uh, my Virginia All-Star game, the East-West Shrine game, we played against the East team, which is 757. And so there were about five players that were going to Virginia like me. And the whole week, all they said was, you wouldn't have had those yards if you would have played in the 757. You didn't play against anybody. You didn't play against anybody. Right. And so I think that the idea of having to prove myself never left, and it, and it translated from football to my second career as an actor and a producer. Um, and I think that's the blessing of growing up in a place like that. Uh, you're always gonna be questioned, you're always gonna be challenged. Your integrity is gonna be challenged, your character is gonna be challenged, and, and your ambition is gonna be challenged. Uh, so you always have motivation to continue to fight and continue to win and prove people wrong. So uh, that's a testament to where I'm from. Hey, TJ, I want to tell you a quick story you probably don't know. Uh, we got ready to play Tampa once, and we were down in Tampa. And uh, during pregame, I saw you and Michael Pittman <laughs> uh, doing your warm-up thing. And with that, I saw y'all arms, man. <laughs> I was scared for our linebackers. I was like, God damn. They just ate in the weight room. But uh, aside from that, man, I, I do understand your passion, obviously, to be considered, you know, a uh, potential Hall of Famer. I mentioned at some point ha having amassed more than 10,000 yard rushing in a 10,000 yard running back club. Uh, I understand your passion for the game. You said you were gonna donate your brain, however, to the Sports Institute. Uh, and you also said that if you had to do it all over again, you wouldn't. Right. You sure about that? With what we know now, obviously what hindsight is 2020, you know, we didn't know all the, uh, the negatives to football and concussions and CTE and all that then. Um, but, but I think knowing now the physical toll that, it, that football takes on you, um, the, the emotional toll that it takes on you, um, I definitely would question it. Um, football actually made me the person who I am. It, it changed my life drastically. It allowed me to, to help my family financially and, and, and be able to um, change their trajectory, change my trajectory. Uh, it, it gave me the opportunity to even be on a platform like this, to even have a voice, to even matter in the world, you know? When you see families that suffer uh, when their you know, fathers or brothers or cousins or sons take their life because of CTE, um, and also you see the physical injuries some of these guys have, that I have, that I'm developing and now. I'm, I've developed, but I'm, I'm really recognizing them on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like, damn, man, um, if I had to do it over again versus doing something else where I could have been equally successful, would I choose the other occupation? Um, and I initially say, yeah, but when I get on platforms like this and I look at you and I look at you and I look at you and I'm like, the brotherhood, this feels like the locker room. You know what I'm saying? I haven't been in a locker room since 2011. 2012, and when I retired from the NFL, I said, man, fuck football, I'm done. I played it my entire life. I don't want it anymore. But I had an escape because I, I didn't have a choice. I couldn't be on a team anymore. But when I'm around you guys, and I know we have similar experiences, 
and I know that we've all been to battle. I played against you. I played against you. Incredible football players. Me and him trained together for years, fighting for Pro Bowl slots, fighting right. for all pro <laughs> slots, but we're still training together. I'm still pushing him, he's pushing me. I don't know. I don't know. Did that abrupt stop or that forcing yourself to be done? Like some guys will let it linger. I want to play, I still want to play. And they don't necessarily have an option. Maybe whether it be their finances or that they still think they can play. But did that abrupt stop for you? Did that make you better prepared for your post career and the things you're doing now? No. I, I, I can honestly say I was not prepared for what the loss of football did to me. Um, I, when I played, I always considered myself uh, someone that played football, not a football player. Um, you know, I went to Virginia, uh, graduated in three years. I, I, my, my mom and dad instilled in me, be a good person first. For example, in high school, I, would, I might have a 300-yard football game and on Friday night and Saturday morning, I'm reaching for the paper because I want to see the stats and right. read the article. But my dad would take the sports section out of the, <laughs> of the paper and make me read the front page first before he would give me the sports section. Wow. So subconsciously, I'm realizing that football was secondary. Uh, if I didn't have A's and B's, I couldn't play. And my coaches knew that, my teachers knew that. Um, so I, n I only put football at the forefront because I realized it was an opportunity to help my family. But I didn't realize how much I loved football and needed football until I retired. And once I retired and I, I realized that I didn't have a locker room to go to anymore, I didn't have an off-season program to get ready for, I didn't have another thousand-yard season to chase or all-pro or Pro Bowl season to chase or Super Bowl to chase. It was like, what am I chasing now? Right. Who am I? What, am, what is my purpose? And for about eight to, to 10 months, um, I woke up every morning, six, seven o'clock in the morning drinking Coronas. And, and I was more of a social drinker when I played in the NFL, but I needed something to make me feel better. And I was on the verge of becoming an alcoholic because of the... Um, withdrawal from football. Man. That boy. What were you looking for? I don't know. I guess um, sometimes the curse to being ambitious is that if you don't have anything to, to be ambitious for, then you don't know your purpose. And football was the only thing that I knew. It was the only thing that I felt validated me outside of just me being a good person. And as we, we all played a long time in the NFL, once you get past your dream is to get drafted, you get drafted, and then you realize, okay, I can play in this league. You start making some plays here or there, and you're like, okay. Then you'd become a, a key player on the team. Then you get a new contract. Once you get past that phase, then it becomes about the game, the X's and O's. And then once it's past the X's and O's, it becomes about just the actual environment you need. Right. I need to be around you. I need to be around you. I need to be around you because nobody, nobody else understands me. Nobody. They don't understand how I might be impatient or I might be violent sometimes or I might have the urge to lash out at somebody um, because in our world, in the locker room, we can do whatever we want and besides getting a fine, you're safe. The NFL Shield protects us. So once, once I was outside the confines of the NFL Shield, the real life hit me. And I was like, oh shit, I'm, I'm by myself. Because at least I'm, if I'm in the locker room with you all, you all understand. And then for a while, it, it, it took me a long time to find people that at least attempted to understand who I was outside of um, just being an actor. When you're waking up and, uh, and, and drinking beer, right, because you, one, we all know, I think the hardest thing about football players getting out of football is that our entire lives were regimented. Like I understood my schedule for 12 months. I knew exactly what I'd be doing, where I'd be doing it, and how I'd be doing it for my entire life, right? For 13 years of my adult life, I did the same thing in January, in February, it was all the same. And that was the biggest adjustment for me, like finding, finding ways to fill my time that I actually felt passionate about, but could also be content. When you're drinking those Coronas, is that where 
the idea for NFL and in football, the gift and the curse, question mark, was how you, how you stated it. Was that where you got the idea to produce and to be a part of something like that? Yeah, because I realized this isn't me, you know? Um, I'm not a drinker. I'm a social drinker, you know, or go out, you know, to a club or here or there and I have a drink there. But, you know, I was training in the gym. I was working out. I had a strict diet. Uh, I mean, I wasn't even eating, eating sugar, ketchup. I mean, I was, a, I was a very, very specific diet. So for me to drink beer every day, all day, I'd start with a beer at six. And then I would just drink the rest of the day, every day. At some point, I realized that this isn't me. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be introduced to, uh, to acting. It wasn't something that I set out to do, but luckily I was introduced to that because the, the road that I was headed down, uh, it wasn't good. And I'll, I'll push back against you, RC. You're talking about a gift and a curse. Is NFL a curse? Because, no, bro, think about it, high risk, high reward. We're all, we're all millionaires because we play football. It's, is it risky? Can you, like right now, they're about to change the concussion protocol. They about to, they, they really, they ain't have, they didn't have a concussion protocol when we played. But right now, Tua, Tua's thing and all that happened, they're about to change the concussion protocol and the injury side of it. But they're paying us millions of dollars well, to I do think the, this. Well, I think the, the big thing, one, for me, it was all a gift. Right, like I, I don't see it that way, but you listen to him and he's, and Thomas is explaining it. He was like, that there were certain parts of it that were a curse. And then he set out to, to show the world how it can be a gift and a curse. This was something that, that he dreamed up in, in his mind because he's football player, entertainer, also someone who struggled with the transition. And you looked at it, Channing, as money, right? You said it a ton of yeah. times. I played this to make as much money as I could possibly play for, for somebody like me. Thomas played from eight to 33. I picked up a football when I was four. You know what I'm saying? And I played till I was 35. And if you don't have something to go into, if you don't understand that life has been larger, the good thing for me, and Thomas kind of mentioned it, football was what I did, it wasn't who I was, right? But we know so many dudes whose identity is locked into that. You may be different. Thomas may be different. Fred may be different. I may be different. But this is a man who excelled to the top of the game that's saying, yeah, I struggled getting out. Like, you know how this dude used to look. This man said he didn't eat ketchup. His only condiment was mustard. <laughs> you go from a, a mustard condiment diet to a damn Corona, corona diet all day, in the morning. his on, stomach looked like right. his arms. And on top of that, <laughs> and on top of that, Channing, we both know Money doesn't solve every problem, man. The money we're making is, is the money we're earning. You know what I'm saying? They're not, they're paying us millions of dollars, but we're earning millions of dollars. But, but that's in your account. That's not in you. Mm. It's different. Money in your account is in your account. What's in you is in you. If you're depressed, if you can't separate yourself from the game, um, if you can't find something that you are just as passionate about, you're gonna, you're gonna suffer internally. And a lot of guys are suffering internally. I was fortunate enough to retire on my own terms. When I went up to my 12th year in Kansas City, one morning I woke up and I was like, damn, I don't know if I wanna do this anymore. Something I had done since I was an eight year old kid. And I don't know what hit me, but it just, when they say, you know, you know, you know. And so my mindset through that year was obviously help us win, try to win a Super Bowl, but I was also thinking who can I pass on the all-time rushing list? Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking on the flip side, don't break your leg and don't get paralyzed. Right. Wow. Because for 11 years you didn't really care. Mm -hmm. You didn't want that to happen, but you were willing to risk it all for that. For sure. So my last year I'm like, I can't break my leg. I can't get paralyzed. I can't go out like that on the back end. Mm -hmm. So every day, that's a part of your thought process. That has nothing to do with money. Yeah. When I retired, I was like Ryan, where I consider myself a person who played football, not a football player, but even me, it still hit me. Because I didn't really, I didn't realize how much the game of football impacted my life until I didn't have it anymore.
It's Football Friday, and you know how we do, but we have to bring you this word from DraftKings. Still remember, use the promo code PIVOT when you sign up. Any new customer with a $5 pregame wager, any football wager, you can get $200 in free bets. Also, too, I'm missing my dog, Freddie T. He's been over in London, but two of the best party cities in the world are going to meet up in NO and Las Vegas, and I can't wait to see who wins that one. Man, I've been doing it on this Daily Fantasy. DraftKings Daily Fantasy, I've been doing it. If you are in a state that does not allow sports betting right now, DraftKings Daily Fantasy, and I'm going to hit on this divisional battle, New England, New York, this week. It's going to be something. I'm telling you, get in that Daily Fantasy. And I'm still pivoting across the pond, and I'm still on my same game parlays. Trust me. Look, let you on a little secret. Denver, Jacksonville, it's an early game. You got to get up. You want to get your bet in? Get up. Same game parlays. Mix and match. Whatever you like that'll fit your betting style, make it happen. Make it happen. Listen, get up with DraftKings because they are waiting on you. Any new customer, use the promo code PIVOT. Pre-game money line bets, $5 gets you $200 in free bets. The Pivot will always be here for you on Fridays, and so will DraftKings any game day. Basketball's popping too. You think about where you are now. Um, it's, it's different. You know, you have entered the world of entertainment where there is no equivalent of being a 3,000-yard rusher your junior year in high school, right? You're starting from the bottom. You're an undrafted free agent. And you know how it is when athletes try to get into other avenues of whether it's entertainment, whether it's career, we're always seen as the athlete. Um, and I read something from you where you talk about kind of the three misnomers about athletes that we have to disprove when it comes to the real world. Right. You know, and when you kind of got into some of these rooms that were different from you and that had to separate, you had to separate Thomas Jones and become Thomas Q. Jones, what were some of the things you went into those different environments to prove, and how did you set out to prove? Well, everything I think starts psychologically, and um, once I decided to take acting and, and producing seriously, um, I did some research because I was just like I was a student in the game of football. Um, anything that I'm going to pursue, and I feel like I want to give my time, my energy to, I want to do some research and study, and at least be prepared. So I looked up multiple athletes that. Um, had made the transition or tried to make the transition. Um, and the one thing that I noticed was that they kept their same football name. Um, and words have meaning. Um, you know, sometimes you look at somebody like Puffy and now he goes by Diddy and, you know, initially you're like, why does he change his name again? Or, or, or Prince and then he, now he went, he went by the symbol. Um, and I never really understood that at the time, but it made more sense to me when I, started to, to pursue acting and producing because people have to see you different to believe you're a different person. Mm. And Thomas Q. Jones is a different person. Thomas Q. Jones is not the football player. Thomas Q. Jones is an entrepreneur. Uh, he's an actor. He's a producer. Um, he's not the same aggressive, uh, impatient, kind of inhumane, savage, person that Thomas Jones, a football player, was. And I'm not saying that to say it in a way where I'm making myself look like I'm crazy, but when I played football, I played football all day. I didn't just play on the field. It translated into my real life. A lot of people so, thought I was an asshole. Um, I wasn't trying to be, but I had to be that way to play at that level. People have no idea how intense the NFL is, man. They have no intense. You, on Sundays, we play, right? Usually, people are going to church Sunday morning. Everybody's happy, they're in a good mood, they relax, they chilling. You know you got the evening going, coming up, you might watch something on TV, a Sunday dinner with the family. Nah, at 10 in the morning, I'm playing the Steelers. And I go from the hotel, and I had to walk in that locker room. I have to gradually go from Thomas Jones, a human being, just, just like everybody else, to Thomas Jones number 20. Mm. So that process is I'm putting my pads in my pants, got my headphones on. It's Sunday, birds chirping. <laughs> I 
everybody smiling, everybody in church, <laughs> preaching, preaching, everything's a go. But but we in the locker room, and I'm thinking, I know RC gonna come down here on the inside zone. I know he's gonna blitz when they walking around on defense. I know he's gonna blitz. So I gotta get my mind right to know that I gotta knock the shit out of you before you knock the shit out of me. At high noon on Sunday. People don't understand the psychology behind that. You gotta, I gotta make myself pissed at you. I gotta make myself wanna physically violate you. And you did nothing to me. That's, psych, that's psychological. And a lot of people don't understand that part of the game because we make it look so easy. We make it look so normal. But I didn't, after, after the game, I didn't just come back to being Thomas with my family. They need to give me some time. Wow. I see them in the, in, the, in the family tent, depending on win or loss. No, you got to give me some time, man. You got to give me some time because I'm, this, this is my job and I'm doing it 100%. And I sometimes don't know how to turn it off. And, I, and it took me a long time to realize how to turn it off, even after I retired. How'd you turn it off? Because I, I don't think that, honestly, I didn't feel the same way he, uh, RC kind of insinuated. Bro, I went into every game knowing what my check was on Tuesday. I rolled to the game like, Yo, this is amazing to me he hearing you, because I was driving to the game saying, <laughs> these motherfuckers about to give me $70,000 to play four quarters. <laughs> like, that was my thought. I'm like, I thought I was getting over on them. Like, man, I'm about to get $70,000 to go hit these Trick them again. Trick them, got, got him, <laughs> got him. But your mind frame, how, did, how does that snap out where, I didn't have to be angry. I used to talk shit, but it was just fun to me to talk shit to people. But you really had to create that hate in your mind for a human that didn't do nothing to you for years and years and years since you were eight. And now you got to turn that off? That seems like a hard venture. It is. Acting saved me. Acting saved me. A acting was my therapist. Finding acting saved my legacy because I was on a track to ruin it. Um, one of the hardest things I had to deal with when I retired was just all the people around me changing and mm. becoming people that I didn't know they really were in the, in the first place. Um, the impact that money um, had on my relationships, jealousy had on my relationships. Um, there were so many people around me, friends, family, that just showed their true colors and it, and it was hurtful and it was painful to realize like this is who these people really are. And these are people that I've given access to my life. I've changed their lives for the better in multiple ways, freely. The older me was confrontational and I would have confronted those people. And I wouldn't have backed down because in football, you know what could possibly happen when you go out there. But you go out there anyway. We're fearless. We're fearless, you know? But acting allowed me to not only turn, that, turn it off, or turn it down initially, and then eventually turn it off, but it gave me an opportunity to move to LA, get away from everybody, um, meet new people, hear new perspectives, get in acting classes and, and, and have my acting coaches actually become my therapists, get some of this off my chest to these acting coaches. And, and they allowed me and taught me how to use all of that energy and put it into my characters. So I didn't necessarily change. I was just blessed enough to learn how to translate all that energy into a character and breathe life in, into this character and, and, and make it a positive thing versus a negative thing. T. Let me ask, what's been, you've done a lot <clears throat> from P Valley, not the Johnsons. I see you guys uh, renewed for that, right? Uh, being Mary Jane, uh, you produced this docu-series, uh, Life After, right. through Amazon Prime. What's been the most fulfilling, whether it's been a role or, pro or producing, what's been the most fulfilling uh, since you've gone on to this post career? Oh, uh, man. I don't know. I know Chan I, probably going to say the sex scene play. That, that probably, <laughs> yeah, I that know he's going to say that. I, for him. I know he's going to say that. <laughs> Fred T, I think it's just the fact that I did it. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that I said I was going to do something um, that's very challenging. Hollywood, man, it's, it's hard, man. It's hard. So much competition. And while I was in the NFL, there were people studying at Juilliard. And, and, you know, dance school and, I mean, just creative arts. Uh, these are creative arts majors in college, mm -hmm. drama majors in college that I'm competing against in these auditions. I just had a self-tape an hour ago. And most of the time you get told no. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you get told no. So how do you continue to keep fighting? 
And I think I'm the most proud of the fact that I continue to fight despite being labeled as a football player, trying to act. And then once I did get an opportunity, people say, oh, I saw you had a cameo, uh, as opposed to me actually playing the character. And I still continued to go and I didn't get discouraged until I realized, wow, people are starting to recognize me as an actor. So I think it's been the overall process of truly being respected as an actor, producing content that people respect, um, and also proving, because I'm representing, I'm representing you all. Regardless of whatever we do, we are representing each other. If you get in trouble, you get in trouble, you get in trouble, I get in trouble, we all get in trouble. Right. Because we all under that NFL shield forever, regardless of whether we play or not. It's gonna be, oh, you do something, you do something, you do something, it's on ESPN. Yeah. Former NFL, former NFL, you know? So I'm proud that I was able to go out in Hollywood and, and be a football player that had longevity, but also now be a respected producer and actor and open the doors for other football players to do the same thing. Man, listen, hiring is so hard today, especially with having all of these things on your plate. So you need to find a place that's fast, easy, and simple to find good people. And ZipRecruiter.com is that exact place for you. And right now, you can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash DraftKings to find qualified employees that can do exactly what you need them to do. And ZipRecruiter, it does the work for you and more. Oh, yeah, ZipRecruiter, they find, they have crazy technology that finds and matches the candidates for the job you're looking for. You ain't wasting no time. They'll find and match the people that you need, and then you can look at the recommended guys, pick your top choices, and figure out who you want to work for your amazing establishment. ZipRecruiter makes it easy. Check this out. Right now, go to ZipRecruiters.com. Try it for free. That's ZipRecruiters.com slash DraftKings. D-R-A-F-T. K-I-N-G-S, ziprecruiter.com slash DraftKings. Get there. Listen, it makes it easy for you. Four out of the five businesses that post on ziprecruiter.com find a viable candidate within the first 24 hours. You heard Freddie T say it, ziprecruiter.com slash DraftKings. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. As a player, you know, we, we play sports. We knew different things. We knew what it took to get an edge on someone. He not working out today or he overeating in the off season. He come back overweight. I ain't doing that. I'm avoiding that. But in Hollywood, you know, acting, producing, how do you gain an edge when it's so highly competitive? And, and some guys are just, you know, driven to opportunities based on, you know, their marketability, I guess. Right. You know, but for someone like you trying to come up and trying to grind, how do you get your foot in the door and make sure you close it behind yourself? It's, it's a similar grind, man. It's staying in shape, staying in class. I was in acting class for, people don't know this, I was in acting classes for four and a half years. Mm. Three different actor studios. I was in class six hours a week for four and a half years. Um, the majority of the roles that I've gotten have been because of my grind, because I took a general meeting with, with someone and they gave me an opportunity to do a self-tape audition. Uh, perfect example, Luke Cage. Uh, I had a general meeting with Chael Coker, the showrunner, and Chael's a big football fan. He went to Stanford, um, and he said, hey, you know, I saw you in Straight Outta Compton, which was only three lines. Uh, I got a crazy story about Straight Outta Compton. <laughs> so Straight Outta Compton, I walk in, it's about 50 guys in there, you know, and it's only three lines for the audition. And the the... The name for the role, it didn't even have a name. The, the name for the role, if you look on IMDb, my IMDb for Strata Company says large man. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the name of the, my name on Straight Outta Compton was large man, you know? So I go in there, this is how green I was in Hollywood. Do the audition, I leave. The next day, my manager calls me and is like, hey, um, they want you for the role in Straight Outta Compton. And I'm like, okay. I'm thinking there's only three lines. I don't know what the film's about, nothing. I just knew I had three lines that I had to memorize and I did it. So the next day I go out to Calabasas, I'm on set, I'm talking to the director and he's like, let me show you what you did on this scene, this take and blah, blah, blah. So we're working through the scene and you know, I'm like, hey, so what else have you directed? And he's like, oh, uh, set it off Friday, the right. Italian job. Well, the director is F. Gary Gray. I have no idea who this guy is. <laughs> and I'm on his set. Right. And then 
I'm like, that's great, man. I love those movies. I literally do not know who this guy is, and I'm on the set of Straight Outta Compton. And then one of the uh, crew members comes by, like, hey, Thomas, can, sorry to bother you. Can I get an autograph? I'm a huge Jets fan. And another guy comes, he's a Patriots fan. I'm a Pats fan, but I got to get you. So I'm signing. He's like, so did you play football? Like, where'd you play? I was like, I'll play for the Jets. Oh, OK, what's your Thomas Jones? Like, yeah, yeah. So neither one of us knew who the other one was. And we're both on, on set with each other. You know what I'm saying? That's how green I was. Um, and, and then me and F. Gary Gray, after that, became incredible friends. Obviously, the movie went on to, to take off and be a legendary film. Um, but Che Coca took a general meeting with him um, about Luke Cage. Um, and he gave me an audition, an audition a self-tape. He was like, I'll let you audition. So I auditioned for the Shades character. Um, and I sent the audition tape in. He liked it. They brought me in for a real audition in front of Disney, ABC, Netflix. And I did a great job in the audition. So I thought I booked it. And then he calls me and he's like, um, unfortunately, we're not going to cast you for Shades. Um, but we're going to cast you for Comanche. I'm like. Who the hell is Comanche, you know? Right. But he's like, trust me on this, you'll love it. So I continued to reach out to Chao over and over again and for him to give me the audition for Shades. And that's how I got the audition for Shades, which led to the Comanche role. Now, Comanche was not in the original character breakdown, but Chao liked my audition and liked me so much that he gave me the opportunity to play a character that wasn't even in the original breakdown. I had to pay for my own trip to New York. I had to pay for my own hotel. I had to pay for my own ride to set, back and forth. This is once you got the job? This is once I this? got the job. This is once that I got the job. That and I, and my, sound and, fun. Well, my entertainment attorney, attorney uh, quit because he basically said, I'm not making any money. But I understood if, if I don't invest my time and my money into this role, I'm going to miss out on a huge opportunity. So I was willing to sacrifice. And that's a part of the grind. I was willing to sacrifice for the opportunity. And that opportunity led to me being brought back for season two with a seven episode arc uh, and having a huge role with scenes with, with Theo Rossi and, and Alfre Woodard uh, and memorable scenes, all because I invested in, and I grinded. So I'm saying that to say I was willing to grind and do what I needed to do on my own to create my own opportunities and not wait for somebody to give them to me. That's cool. And they don't never, they don't never cast you as like a crackhead though. You always like the sexy dude. <laughs> you ever seen a crackhead that swole? I was gonna say like, <laughs> not, no, bro. Like you I gotta be honest. Never seen nobody like, in the hood like that. <laughs> like I know you. I don't want to take away from your grind, but six know. hours a day, four years, like that's crazy. No, but, no, no. Like, no. bro, like if you didn't look the way you look, you, it might. No, it might no. Be tough on you. No, no. I would. I would, listen. Where I am now as an actor, I would love to play a crackhead. I would love to play a crackhead. Crack don't do that to people. You know? Nah, but I'm saying, if, if I booked a crackhead role, then I would uh, take on the look of a crack. You would crack up you a little bit? Yeah, I'd crack up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, I'd crack, crack up a little I'd lose weight, you yeah. know, I'd slim down, because um, I'm a committed actor, you know? I'm committed to the craft, I'm committed to the characters. Um, because, you know, it's like anything else. The, the more you climb and the more success you have, the more confidence you have, the more you want to challenge yourself. You know, um, in the NFL as a rookie, you might want to, you know, I, I might want to play against a team that doesn't, that doesn't have a good run defense. Because I'm like, okay, I might be able to give it off this week. But the older you get, nah, I want the Steelers. Right. Nah, I want Baltimore. Want back. Nah, you know what I mean? Because it means something. If I get 130 yards on, on Troy and Ryan and and, and Potsy and the Steelers, yeah, that's respect. So it's the same thing as an actor, and that's where I'm in my career. You notice you didn't say Miami, Just, huh? You no, I didn't, didn't say, say Miami. No, I didn't say them. Because it wouldn't mean as much. I hit him in his knee a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that big bitch in the shoulder for nothing. Hey, this dude was always around the ball. <laughs> Appreciate it. A, a nuisance. <laughs> always around the ball and always talking the entire game. It doesn't matter whether they get blown out or, or whether they're winning. <laughs> He's the same player. Thomas, it feels like our <laughs> life. He is always <laughs> around. And that joker is always talking. We weren't winning much. But <laughs> you can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask, man. We, we had a good friend, uh, Mari Harwood. Yep. 
And I'm, I'm sure y'all crossed paths. Yeah, 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 yes, my So the, he told me about the sex scenes where I was wondering, like, the sensuality of He's like, there's so many people around, there's so many lights, there's so many cameras. Right. So I understand that side of it. But you were Cuddy Buddy on what, Be and Mary Jane, right? Yeah. So you and Gabby would, like, and I, you were biting lips and all that. Like, you was, <laughs> it was very sensual. <laughs> what did he do, Chad? What did he do to the lip? He bit the lip and pulled that bitch off. <laughs> I, said, I said, oh. Yo, <laughs> hey, oh. get this guy out of here, man. We ain't calling time out. Time out. <laughs> but I got to ask you, man, because like, it, it's, it's no, knowing that Gabby and D-Wade happily married and they doing their thing. I don't want to know if my wife laid up and kissed somebody. I don't want to be that person. Like, if you are on scene with somebody and y'all have sensual scenes, like, if you see D-Wade, do you... Do you, nah, you, you nah. panic? Because I wouldn't want to, like, I just, I bit your nah, wife. No, 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 no. I can, and I can understand that perspective from someone that, that's not an actor. But, um, you know, like, like Omari said, I mean, you know, you have cameras around, you're playing a character. You know, Cuddy Buddy's not me. I make, I mean, I make a piece of him me, you know, because you have to add a part of you to the character to make it authentic. But um, you're just telling a story, you know? Um, I'm looking at it from a perspective of, of Cuddy Buddy was someone that Mary Jane needed at that time in her life. She needed a friend, a friend with benefits. And it's TV. So uh, I, I much rather make it look real than make it look fake. And then now people think that's how you really are in real life. You know what I'm saying? Like, you <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I rather, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, I'd much rather, I'd much rather. <laughs> I might try to sacrifice some, 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 maybe some personal backlash for making sure at least <laughs> I know I'm doing my thing on TV. Hey, T, yeah. like I, when you, when, when you're Googled, right, and you go to images, for some reason, it's not a ton of football images, but it's a lot of images of you with like actresses mm -hmm. and, and like singers. Mm -hmm. And this looks like during, during your, your career. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, making it look real and, and drawing up on some of your experience. You said, what he said? I got to put a little Thomas in it. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Did you draw on some of your, uh, we don't want to call you a playboy, man, throughout your career. That's a negative connotation. Um, what got did you, he got game. Did you draw on some of your very high level uh, shootery, your shoot game, right? Where you shot your shot while you played. Did you draw on some of that? to play Cuddy Buddy? You know I said, like you, you said, what'd you say? Before the game, I gotta put my headphones on and I gotta put my, my pads in my pants and I gotta make myself hate that person. You know, did you have to think back to some of your escapades as a New York Jet and say, yeah, you know what? I gotta bring this into this scene. Like, I remember I did that. She actually still DMing me. And I think he's trying to say, uh, <laughs> Megan is back on the market, your ex. <clears throat> uh, Y'all gonna run it back. I said nothing about making. I good. think he was trying to say that. I did not, but I do want to know. Listen, man. Um, Speak up, bro. <laughs> Megan is an incredible person, man. She's a sweetheart. Um, we had a really, really, you know, good, loving relationship. She's got an incredible family. Um, some of her family I'm, I'm still cool with to this day. And I wish her the best, you know. Um, I, I think her, her acting career has been incredible. Um, you know, I know she has a new show. Uh, as well. Um, you know, it's ironic that I'm in the same business, you know, uh, as, as, uh, as, as she is. But no, listen, man, um, any prior uh, relationship that I've, that I've had, you know, I try my best to learn mm. from the relationship and be accountable for whatever it is that I felt I could have done better. And I think that that's how you maximize the time that you spent in those relationships. And, and I learned a lot with, with her. And um, I always have love for her, and I always appreciate our time together, and I wish her the best. Do you have a sexy voice? Because, like, uh, I talk like this, but then, like, when it's me and my wife, I'll be like, hey, you know, I'm soon go, boy. Been no, the I, whole time. I'm just saying, so can your voice get any more sexy? Because you already talk. Whoa, 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 that? Like, you got a very sensual uh, approach, and it's very melodic, <laughs> and it's soft and smooth. Like, do you go deeper when you... No, man, I don't know, man. My dad used to be on the radio. You yeah. know what I'm saying? My dad was a radio DJ. 
Um, and so I think, you know, get it from him. I don't know, you know? Uh, I just talk how my vocal cords allow me to. <laughs> but no, like, but when, like, now I'm like, you know, I got the little voice, but then it's me and Asia, and then, you know, I'll be like, ooh, mm, that thing, ooh, my <laughs> Like, I'll get a little deeper. Like, is, is, do you have a, <laughs> do you get deeper? Or, cause it's deeper shit now. You don't sound like, I don't know how deep your Yo, voice can get. First off, pause. Where did y'all find this I guy? I get after <laughs> from... Yo. Oh, you gotta be no, sensible. No, I like no, to, no, I like no, to talk. No, I don't you say I like to talk on the field. I like to talk everywhere. Right, no, I love it, man. Yeah. Listen, I, I think, I think it might be a subconscious thing if you're talking to a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, you might switch it up a little bit, but I'm not doing it for you. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> don't get it twisted. I'm talking, I'm talking to you regular. <laughs> I'm the one that always got to pivot the conversation back because we're slowly wrapping up. But uh, I did want to touch on, you know, I, I briefly mentioned Life After, you know, the docuseries Amazon Prime. And uh, I think they follow 12 former fo only football players. 12, uh, yeah, NFL players, yep. 12 NFL players. You know, talk about that as well as, you know, the other things that you're in. So, Absolutely. you know, let the people right. check you out. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this docuseries that I produced called Life After uh, with um, Paul Hutchins, who's the creator of the show, uh, and Brandon Myrie, who also played in the NFL for three years. Um, it's a, it's a docuseries that follows the lives of 12 retired NFL players. And it just shows, uh, how each player had a different experience when they retired. Um, some guys um, struggled. Some guys struggled with depression. Some guys struggled to find something uh, that they were passionate about, similar to me. Uh, other guys had ideas of what they wanted even before they retired. Uh, Justin Forsett, uh, his is very interesting. He's one of the players and he played for Seattle. Uh, he turned, you know, the whole shower pill joke, yep. right? Uh, didn't you talk about taking a shower pill or something one time? No, he don't take showers yeah. at all. Oh, I mean, wow. Different. Okay, no, so I mean, he, OD, I mean, he ODs on, on shower no, pills. He just I takes base, the whole bottle. I bathe a little bit. Well, well anyway, he, he has a company um, that he started from the whole shower pill joke. Super cool. And so if you watch the docuseries, it's on Amazon Prime streaming now, you'll see how he took that shower pill joke and turned it into a multi-million dollar business, uh, him, and his, him and his partner, after, um, after they retired. So there's a lot of incredible guys. Demarcus Ware's on, uh, has an episode. Spice Adams has an episode. Sherrod Martin has an episode. Myron Roll mm -hmm. has an incredible episode. Myron Roll, who's now a brain surgeon. Uh, we actually flew to Central Africa um, to watch him do um, surgery in real time on this, on this uh, child's brain. Uh, it's a really intense docuseries. It's very intimate. It's showing NFL players as human, hum and it's showing black men as fathers and family men and husbands, all the things that we are that unfortunately we're, you know, painted as we're not. Not being right. Um, but just in general, if you love if you love sports, but if you just want a lifestyle docuseries, this is the one to watch. It's, it's called Life After. It's on Amazon Prime streaming now. I, I love that too, because in the, the names that you mentioned, Sherrod's a barber, no, right? Spice Adams is a social media sensation. He's in the in entertainment business. Myron Roll is a neurosurgeon. It's not only showing, it's, it's also showing athletes move into things that don't necessarily have to draw back to them being athletes. They've used and flexed other muscles that are extremely important in us continuing to live life, continuing to be successful, continuing to be fulfilled. And I think in listening to you talk, you talked a lot about life after. Um, Freddie T always asked when we finish the show, what was your biggest pivot? It seems that you've given us so many pivots and big pivots throughout uh, this episode. So I think the question I would like to ask you before we wrap is when you think about how people are going to look back on who is now Thomas Q. Jones, right? And there's no way that we don't roll the football player into that. Right. What do you want them to say about you. It's not, not to be morbid, when your obituary is written, what do you want that one key sentence to be about Thomas Jones? I would like them to say, uh, Thomas Jones was a good man that did everything well. I think that sums up who I am. I think at the core, I'm not perfect, but I'm a, I'm a really good person with good intentions with everything I do. And everything I do, I wanna be great. 
And even if I don't make it to greatness, as long as people know that I gave my best uh, and, I, and I added to whatever the, the process was, I think I can live with that. And T, how much time you got when you off? Because we need a personal trainer. No, <laughs> I got to ask him, did, did I, you have to lotion up to put them clothes on? No. <laughs> To slide them on? You good? His clothes ain't that tight, Chad. What about them jeans? He told can we me pan I down on Can we pan down on this man's high waters right here? What are we doing here, man? Did you have him? That's, that's those, who taught me. Are those hemmed? That's who yeah, I got him hemmed. <laughs> I do that too. I ain't lying to you there. I, oh, oh, I oh. These are not though. These are the original joints. <laughs> but I I don't him, see, hey, I'm not talking to I you though. My hands too, dog. It don't matter. I'm, I'm not saying, talking to you. Man. No. Appreciate you, brother. Hold up. Limitless. Take a sip of cap, pin in it. I find the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a sip of cap, pin in it. I find the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up.